Welcome back to Learning Analytics Tools course. In this week, uh, we will just overview what we learned in this whole uh, semester. There won't be any new topics taught in this class, but we will revisit what we discussed in an abstract view. So in this course so far, we talked about data collection, that is what data to collect and for which environment. Then we talked about how to represent the data, that is very, very key and uh, important aspects. Uh, because we can collect data in a different uh, learning environment from a different resources, but representing data is very key. Uh, I suggested a simple method that is, um, you know, I, I suggested the method that is you always have a timestamp, you know, timestamp and uh, user ID. If you, you allow the students to do multiple sessions, you know, you have a classroom environment where students have to do it two, three times, come to the class, or they have to interact with the system for multiple times, or in online, they have to interact for multiple times, collect the session ID, and the action they are doing, what is the action? Are they uh, doing reading, are they doing some uploading a task or assignment, something like that. And from the actions, you also should collect the contextual data. The contextual data is where this action is taking place, where and what are they doing? Like if they are and uh, if they are reading some page, what page they are reading and uh, why they are doing it. They are simulator, they are interacting with the uploading assignment, they are uploading for what? For performance or uh, you know some other indicator why. Also, if they are answering some questions in a quiz or in online, you know, online uh, assignments, please think about uh, what is the option they select and what was the correct option. So, if the action is answering to a question in MCQ, so you need both um, correct option, what option is selected. So think about all these things, you know, current option, what option is selected. So this is the action and the contextual information. So how do we come up with the actions in a three different environments? That's a very key important point, right? So uh, I might have uh, in uh, interacting with the daily technology enhanced learning environment, I might have uh, interaction like navigating from one window to other window, clicking some buttons, every clicks I'm capturing, right? That's why I suggested you capture all the clicks. But can I consider everything as action or uh, not necessarily because if you consider everything as action, there will be too many features to come up, you know. So if you are talking about action, think of the major actions they do. It's only the major actions, you know. Uh, for example, uh, in, a, in a Moodle or in a MOOC systems or in a, in a technology enhanced learning environment, what is the major actions they do? Uh, you might consider login, you know, login as the logging into a system or system response. That's maybe start of the action. That's not necessarily important for us when you do the you know, analysis in a sequential manner, but you consider login is important just to know when it is started. The login is associated with the session ID. That also gives you, you know, are the uh, session is continued or they logged in multiple times. And, uh, by login ID, you can construct features like uh, how many times the login happened in a week, in a day, or within hours, and how long they spent, average time they spent on each login time. Uh, after logging in, uh, what are the main uh, actions they do in the environment? Uh, for example, uh, if you use some LMS, they might be reading something, watching videos, right? So reading, watching videos or you know uh, answering questions. So you can talk it as a quiz, you can mark it as a quiz, answering questions, the quiz or um, they might be in the discussion forum, you know, discussions. What else? Is there anything, something specific to the system? Just mark it. Uh, some of systems we saw they are interacting with the simulator. Some systems they are drag and dropping something. So if you have any specific items, mark that as actions. Now for each action in a read, uh, if the student is reading, are they reading which page or which PDF or uh, you know, what are the content they are reading? If you chunk the content into smaller concepts, it's easy to track that. Then if they are watching a video, what are they watching the video? If you want a minute data, talk about uh, are they watching in uh, no, a single 1x speed or 1.5x speed? 
and uh, we most of the people know we do mostly you, when you watch the online lectures uh, in, if it is very slow we watch in 1.5 x speed uh, that works well. So, watching speed all the seeking the video from one place to place you can add all this information as a contextual information you know this I mean as a contextual information these are the major actions uh, listed in the thing then contextual information. The first step when you do the analysis is that you plot these actions frequency uh, you know number of times occur for each student in average uh, the time they spent on each of these actions. And uh, if there is some interesting aspect happens go look into the contextual information why this student is looking at it. A typical example is um, for example you have 100 students ok. You saw 50 students uh, based on a pre-test and post-test score they are low performers and 50 students based on pre-test score they are high performers. Um, or maybe uh, say instead of 50 let me put it out you know um, um, no it is 40 there are some 35 and you know there are there are in between you know some some students who are, who are not neither low nor neither high but in between. So, we do not want to you know classify every everyone just below 50 like 49 is a low or 51 is high that makes no sense. So, we can give a median value or some gap or uh, maybe we can consider that as a med, uh, no, medium performance or you know we can keep it as a buffer saying that I want to clear students who are really got less than 30 students who got above 70 is a low and high you can make your own uh, bifurcation right. So, that is it. Now, you have this data first step you do is after collecting these features you know the features you are talking about login, read, watching, plot the graph you know and uh, find out is there any difference like in the frequency in the average time they spent. If there is a difference well and good go and talk about it why the difference whether that difference can impact the students performance that is hypothesis test it out with the data correlation or do prediction that is good. But you see that uh, but both students all of them are reading time is same you know watching time is also same kind of same there is no significant difference you know you know you can run a significant test on this data. Then you might want to go further if both low and students are reading for 5 minutes on an average how some students are able to get good score comes to not able to good score maybe it lies in the what are they reading and how are they reading. Now we go look into the contextual information and see is there any difference in the context comes out. That is how we do the analysis. So, I so I was trying to uh, explain this in a week two. So, you might have had the idea of what is actions, what are the context, but I want to give you the picture why it is happening in the learning analytics. Next is um, you know we do analysis. Um, so, we do analysis I was explaining that uh, then you do reporting. So, uh, since there are a lot of data and you mean a lot of graphs do you want to report everything to uh, when you publish it or you want to report everything to a stakeholder. So, depending on what are you reporting and whom you are reporting you have to you know um, make a graph and uh, make a plot or so make inference out of it and report it. So, make sure that uh, you uh, know what are you reporting and who are you reporting and what is their interest also or uh, what you want to tell them like you do not want to tell all the story to the uh, everyone uh, in the public. So, you might be interesting saying that hey we know all this other factors are already established in literature we also found it same, but there is something new we found it which is not exist you know uh, anywhere in literature we want to talk about that let us talk about that something new. So, that is a gap you have to identify and report it ok. Then after reporting uh, the whole idea is to you know to understand the learning process and improve the teaching learning strategy. So, this is kind of what is learning analytics definition I talked about in a week one lecture. If you remember uh, what is learning analytics is to collect data you know measure collect report analysis in the context of students working on it and in order to improve the students learning the whole the primary goal is to improve students learning it is not nothing about you know. Uh, you create a model uh, you are able to predict the students uh, performance you know it is it is about how to use that uh, knowledge uh, to improve your teaching learning strategy so the students uh, learn better ok. 
So, we talked about different learning environments like a face to face uh, online systems and um, you know uh, also uh, um, LMS kind of things. Online systems includes LMS and tele both. So, in a face to face uh, most of the uh, data collection is by self reporting. This is a key actually very uh, important. Um, most of the data is collected by self reporting or human observation the only things you can do okay. Uh, self reporting is that uh, you might run a survey ask student hey, what are you feeling about or how many students are you know um, uh, engaged in the class or you ask them some, some kind of uh, uh, questions they answer something and based on that you know you can identify whether they understood or not. Uh, and uh, self reporting can be form of you know it can be in the online also, but uh, you know you can be check um, a small piece of paper passed on the classroom and they will answer some set of questions. Or the second way of collecting data is human observation, you are a teacher, in, you are instructor, you are in the class and you are collecting students um, performance, or students engagement, students activities or number of times the students interacted with the peer all these things you are collecting. Human observation is one of the valid or well accepted observation. The only key point is the researcher should not get biased to you know labeling each and every action of the students, the participants. So, in order to avoid bias, please create a inter, inter rater or inter observable reliability. So, it is based on is it observable or rater it is called inter observable reliability. So, we use Kogan's compound. We talked about Cogan's kappa also in our earlier weeks. So, we there we mentioned the kappa is used to compare two performance of two systems or to you know to measure the agreement between two observers. So, look at what is inter-rater reliability, how to use Cogan's kappa if you are doing human observation. This is a very key part. The reason is um, you should not get biased to labeling the particular uh, uh, particular uh, variable you are recording. Say for example, in the classroom I want to understand the students engagement and uh, you might be the observer standing in the classroom. Say there are, um, so there are uh, five, 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 five observers observing a class of you know 50, each observer is observing 50 students, they are observing the round robin method. So, that is every five, 2 minutes I will observe student 1, next 2 minutes I will observe student 2 uh, like at the end of 20th minute you observe all the 10 students and you come back to the again 22nd minute you will be observing the same student again and you are marking in a note saying that student 1 from time 10 to 10 to uh, is engaged and he interacted with the peer for 5 minutes or all the coding. So, you have to first come up with the coding mechanism what are the things you have to code. There are a lot of well you know uh, this is called um, uh, qualitative research, the lot of uh, research resource available in such articles go and look at the coding existing, you might find a new coding find it out. Once you have a coding you record you know students engagement all this thing and how do you compare whether you are doing it correctly you are not biased. So, what you do you compare your coding with your, uh, your uh, you know peers others other persons coding. So, in that when you compare inter observable reliability you both both observer both two or three or more observers has to observe the same student for a certain period of time. So, usually when we start uh, this never happens this kappa is not uh, may not be good you know kappa may not be good uh, may not be really great ok. Uh, so, what we do um, sorry. Um, So, kappa might be low. at the beginning ok. So, what you do is uh, first you will have a set of rubrics to mark uh, this when a student moves and talks is kind of engagement you have your own rubrics coding mechanism. You discuss with your peer and uh, both understand the coding mechanism both are observing. After observation you do the kappa calculation if the kappa is low uh, if the kappa is you know if the kappa is uh, less than um, if the kappa if the kappa if the kappa is you know. Uh, if, the, so if the kappa is uh, less than say 0 0.8 uh, discuss with your peer who is other observer and talk where the mistakes made and why he thought that is a particular uh, not engagement and you thought it is engagement, why you thought it is not engagement, why the particular you know other observer thought it is engaged, discuss and resolve the conflicts, redo the assignment you know again observation of a new student or same student first new set of period of time ok. 
uh, then you check again the kappa score make sure the kappa score is uh, more than 0 0.8 0 0.8 or more than 0 0.8 that is a very very key uh, expert when you are doing the human observation ok that is a very key. Sometimes uh, it is not that you will be observing the students in a real uh, you know real live environment you might be recorded the students uh, facial expressions uh, students actions in the class and you will be looking at the video and recording it because you want more data. If you want to observe uh, data in a real classroom uh, you may not able to observe all the 50 students data or you do not have much too many observers to observe the data. So, you will you will do not have real amount of data. So, what you might do is you might keep 2 or 3 cameras uh, observe record the students actions and you might uh, look at the student one in the camera and make, do, make down their you know, list down their engagement. In those scenarios again um, talk to your inter observer both watch the same amount of time say 5 minutes or 10 minutes of video and mark down all the rubrics make sure the kappa is greater than pointed. If not again uh, redo the assignment on a new new student or a new time frame not the same time frame which are already observed. So, make sure you make the kappa is more than 0.8. So, even observation can happen in a real time also in the video that is thing I want to discuss here. The second one is online systems uh, self reporting it is not just self reporting of surveys also the students is answering the questions and the performance all these things can also consider. Other thing is click stream data you know human observation data. In, uh, in general uh, in a uh, in a uh, not in a you know LA but in a, in a ITS intelligent tutoring system kind of environment what we consider is simple thing you know there are something called a profile this is kind of a static information you know static in the sense it is um, it's, it, it's a profile of a student like age, gender, uh, the year of the study, uh, the prayer knowledge, uh, uh, maybe if you are collecting the parents information all this thing is kind of profile information when they come to systems kind of a static. And uh, click stream data is other data you observe all the interactions. And uh, then you might uh, you know the performance uh, performance data is another data. So, stat profile uh, performance uh, click stream data like that is the data we cover. By using the click stream data and the performance by combining these two you might be coming up with uh, some dynamic data. What I mean dynamic data you might be measuring the skill or you might be measuring the engagement something you might be measuring something for your research that data is dynamic. Why I say dynamic at the beginning you might start with you no know, uh, median value or middle value then based on students click stream and performance you will change it whether delta increases or decreases. So, a student is performing very well and is interacting with all the you know, uh, artifacts in the system you might increase the engagement more and more and more. Uh, they are not interacting with all the system they are just simply talking watching a video they are not doing any performance you might you know reduce their some other skills can be reduced. So, this is changed based on the student performance and the dynamic. So, in, in general the data is that that the full data only by using this dynamic data what you actually provide a new feedback or new content it is part of you know intelligent tutoring systems. So, that is the whole idea. So, that is the whole idea of click stream data even in online systems you do the human observation that is why I said that if you might capture the videos or something and you might sit down and uh, record the uh, facial expressions and do it. For example, in online um, online uh, environment you might be capturing students um, facial expressions uh, or data from eye trackers or something else. Uh, if you have facial expressions data you may not be able to you know code it uh, directly you can ask the students to self report about their own emotions watching their own videos or you can sit uh, observers can observe uh, the, the students facial expressions and code their um, emotions affective states. So, in, a, in any case uh, make sure that you do the uh, Kogan's kappa and the kappa score is more than 0.8 there should be no bias in human observation. Uh, if you are not doing that you know the uh, that people do not consider that data is you know valid that is very very important. So, all this data collection any environment any data you collect please get the participants consent and if you are getting a participant consent please make sure with whom you can share the data who has access to data in the future what you will do what are their rights and think about all these things when you do the participants consent data ok. So, 
what we uh, talked about is uh, you know um, in, a, in a environments we might collect data from different instruments like a surveys and the click stream data, uh, quizzes, you know the test performance all these things we talked about. And uh, these are all raw data right and uh, for, from this we get a raw data like a response to questions or the clicks or uh, they speak some utterances or the facial expressions it's all their raw data. So, now think for a minute uh, how do you extract features you know from this raw data and why we are doing that that is very very key important. I can collect all the data facial expressions they are talking you know the utterances and the clicks every clicks responses performance why you are doing that and why how do you extract features from this log data. Please pause for a minute and write down your answer after writing it down resume to continue. So, the feature extraction why we are doing it depends on uh, you know uh, like uh, why we are doing it that is why you have to go and predict something and uh, you have how to extract the features to identify the student compare the students with the other students or uh, to compare with the baseline performance everything. And uh, what features to extract it depends on the research goal ok that is why I mentioned in the first slide you know and the actions uh, you want to go you know context to information level or simply the actions. So, Q come up with their own number of features whether it is simply the major actions level or actions combined with the context to information. And uh, this is where the domain knowledge is important. Not everyone will be extracting a good feature uh, the one who is working on the domain say education domain will be able to extract a good feature. If you are creating a own system and uh, you know the students interaction the system means something. So, then you might able to tell uh, from the experience the experts knowledge you have in that particular system the particular domain you might say students clicking these 3 buttons or reading for 5 minutes and doing quiz or uh, might be looked like the student is you know uh, reading this or something. How do we know that it is like it is your expertise and uh, if I talk to teacher in a classroom environment if a student is you know coming for only 40 percent of time for attendance and is not submitting 3 uh, assignments at all will he pass the exam the teacher will say yeah he will not pass the exam because I know it because based on experience you can tell that. So, this is called I, I call this a domain knowledge that domain knowledge is expertise knowledge you might possess in this domain. The same data collection you no know, machine learning method can be applied if you know the domain of you no know, mechanical engineering you might apply in that mechanical engineering problem or if you know some other domain you can apply that. So, my focus you know with your expertise in the learner learning environments in the learning please use that knowledge for the uh, creating features. And um, this is important uh, the reason is uh, the domain uh, knowledge will be built up based on how many years you are working on it, how many features uh, how many systems you created how many features you are extracting. The one way to start is read the research papers uh, to understand how they extract features, what are the features extracted in a similar environment. Look at those features, list down all the features then you might be able to you know come up with your own set of features or uh, combine some features you create your own features. And, um, and uh, frequency and time is important I, it's, I said that you know uh, if there is a major actions simply create a feature as a frequency of that action over a certain period say over last one hour, last few hours, last 2 days, last 3 days, last 5 days, over 1 session, over last 5 sessions frequency of any major action. For example, if the major action is reading what I do is uh, number of times read ok, number of read in 1 session. I am not talking about what are they reading, which page they are reading that is if needed you go further, but I am just saying if they are reading just go about how many times they are reading. Same num um, So, same uh, number of um, read um, in last 5 sessions or same uh, in 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 40 minutes. So, you can extract multiple features from you know from one major action. So, why do we expect multiple features um, it we you can expect multiple features and find out which features are redundant by you know do a you know correlation analysis or correlation with the you know a dependent variable or feature extraction methods will help you to do that. So, that is a feature you might have a something 
how do you, you might say no no that does not make um, looking at the lead session for last 5 years you might say that is perfectly, perfectly correct if you have a particular domain knowledge. You might say no no this particular scenario I do not think last 5 sessions of reading will not really helpful you can remove it. That is why I say it is a domain knowledge is applicable. So, for same read action I will create multiple features based on the time uh, average average read time in one session you know it is that and you can talk about average read uh, read in uh, uh, last 20 minutes or average read in last 5 sessions or you can be specific that average read before taking quiz something like that. So, here I am combining two actions. So, you can come up with a lot of features that is why I am saying that go and look at the papers already which is uh, talked about this and also the domain knowledge will help you to come up with it. You can say that if a student is reading more than 3 minutes before taking the quiz then there might be you might be doing better or if the student is you know reading many times like uh, spending 5 minutes and you did some other actions then quiz is may not be good. So, you might come up with your own hypothesis to test it you extract these features from the raw data. So, there are two things frequency and time this is a very basics and uh, you can all start with that how do you improve this set of features how to come up with the you know, new features and combining multiple major actions or you can combine the major plus you know contextual information it is all come up with your domain knowledge ok that is let us start from here that is what I say. So, and uh, what we did also we talked about you know basics in um, machine learning algorithms we talked about pattern mining you um, uh, know process mining and um, clustering uh, uh, techniques performance metrics uh, some of the regression logistic engineers nay based decision tree uh, we talked about all these things in this course. So, revisit them um, what is pattern mining and process mining most of you might know the clustering techniques you know and, uh, and regression process mining and pattern mining might be new to uh, many of you uh, check it again it is very interesting and check for associate mining also for the pattern mining. And uh, importantly this performance metric is might be something new uh, the reason is uh, not many people cared about what is a metric what to look for uh, that is very very important and why this metric is needed is also I wanted to you know inform you guys. So, that you know how to compare two things. Mm, then um, how this algorithm, uh, algorithms are trained uh, I never talked about it you know in a linear regression I said that hey simply linear regression I said that uh, there is a magic app you know there are a lot of dots there is a one line and uh, there is a you know um, um, another line I said which line to pick I told which line to pick the which line to pick is easy uh, just because you know um, we, are, we know that. So, from the each dot you know you have to find out the gap um, sorry this is the one uh, you know, uh, loss function of this and the similarly this loss function for this is a different and you take the one which is. But how do I change whether it is dash or change if I find this loss function so should I change it to an upper direction should I move it down I never talked about how it is trained. There is a reason for that and uh, I also never talked about hyperparameters in each algorithm because I faced talk about training I should be involving hyperparameters. At the beginning of the course also in the introduction I clearly mentioned this course is for uh, someone who is new to the machine learning and who do not require any any mathematics or anything. Uh, so, I try completely avoid the calculus in this course. So, in order to avoid calculus I did not do the talk about how it is trained and what are the hyperparameters in each algorithm. But I request all of you to go and if you are interested to more about that or uh, go and watch videos by Professor Andrew Engine each of this uh, uh, you know uh, each of these recordings and uh, and uh, learn more about it or lot of very good resources are available in internet. If you are really uh, really interested about machine learning there are very good books available in machine learning also ok. The uh, aim or focus of this course is not that you know it is not to teach every algorithm and with uh, training and uh, you know training and hyperparameters because this course is not for only you know 
the one who is already well trained in the uh, mathematics or will know the programming or something like that. This is for everyone. So, I just kept that part very, very low. If you are much motivated because of hey, this is interesting, I want to know more, please read further. Okay? So, also in this course we talked about multiple tools, uh, ISAT we had a video, I hope you would have done the assignment on ISAT, uh, use it, uh, the ISAT tool is available, just use it and uh, check this course if it is useful, use it and uh, you can contact the developer and uh, he will be happy and uh, you can do that. Also we have given you know a small scripts to run a sequential pattern mining. Um, it is not you know it is not a, a tool as a ISAT or you know the, the other big tool, but we wrote a small script to extract the sequential pattern mining. If you are find some other tools available online please go and use it, there is no uh, you know no harm. Uh, you it might call as associate mining or something like that. So, understand what is you know pattern mining, it checks the frequent patterns you know you know uh, in a you know fine grain level and what is a process mining, a process mining observes you know old process. So, process mining we introduce you know ProEM software uh, that is available for you know free for academic usage also for commercial does one software for free. So, use that software too, Vega is completely free for everyone use it, Orange is free for academic. So, use these tools, do not stop only with these tools you know if you are interested go to Tableau, go to uh, you know Rapid Miner, explore more tools. I will talk about that in detail how, how, how you can expand your you know uh, the next steps. But these five tools we covered and make sure you learn everything well and um, if you if you, the videos are not enough go and check YouTube videos for process miner, Vecon, Orange. ISAT um, that is simple, very simple to do, we gave a sample data just upload it you will see everything, you just have to click buttons, it is very simple. SPM it is it's not you know it may not be the complete tool you have to run a uh, script. If you are interested such uh, you know, other softwares which is talks about associate mining, we do not find any good software for associate mining in a you know, educational setup uh, that can be shared freely with everyone. That is why we have to write our own scripts. Okay? Hope you guys you know enjoyed that uh, interacting with the tools because this course is about tools and uh, this main focus is that you get to know some tools and uh, apply on some data. So, now I want to ask um, something different uh, that is what is the difference between 20th century and 21st century? When I say 20th century, um, imagine the time before uh, 2000 or you can go up to 2003 or 4. What is the difference between 20th century teachers learners versus 21st century teachers learners? Think about it, um, write down your answers, um, after writing it down please assume to continue. In 20th century, uh, we see teacher as a um, source of knowledge. Um, I did not have access to most of the books, uh, only the library have limited books. The teacher has all access to books, you know, uh, the library books and uh, he might have a notes from somewhere, he might have read a lot of books and uh, in the library also he has a special access, you have, you have all the access to books. And the teacher teaches everything you know um, with examples, there is a textbook, he covers the each and every syllabus and he explains the problem and he goes off and asks us to solve the you know um, the, the exercise solutions and problems. If you have doubts, the teachers might teach. And we see teacher as you know guru like he is a you know, uh, elixir of knowledge and he has everything and uh, uh, he is the one person to go after for everything you know, to ask for this. And, uh, and he is always there to answer my questions and, um, and he guides uh, in fact not just you know teaching, um, the good teacher, you know, guides beyond your subject, hey what to do, how to do and a lot of discussions, a lot of things happened. This is 21st century teacher. Most of you might be if you are a teacher, um, you know if you are a teacher and you are born in you know, 1980s, uh, you might be a, you might have seen the 21st, 20th century teachers. But if you are a teacher now, you are continuing that, you are not a 20th century teacher, you are 21st century teacher. What is 21st century teacher? You are not a source of knowledge anymore, okay? The whatever data you can access, whatever resource you have, the students have more than that. Students have access to lot of more data and lot of more uh, you know resources. You are not a source of knowledge. Uh, do not expect that you have to teach everything and you have to be there and uh, you, are, you know everything that is all gone. 
student knows more than you in a particular subject and not just students lot of industry experts and everybody writes their own blog it all changed after web 2.0 and the videos are coming in youtube or other other video uh, you know video serving platforming platforms so you are a motivator to students like which course to do and the students for resources guides them you know hey look at this particular resources for this particular topic uh, but that does not works much you know they are the rating agencies you go to Quora you check out which resource is good you read about it but you kind of pulling together saying that do this particular task maybe you are guiding them what to do next if they have any issues but there are you are not you know just as you are not the only person who source of knowledge that is what I am trying to say. So, you be a motivator and uh, do that. So, I picked up that you know I am not a 20th century teacher, I was a 20th century student, I was asking my teacher for everything, I go to library, only the library has a 4 books, I read notes, I read it. But now I am a 20th, 21st century teacher, I did not teach everything about all these videos. What I try to do is motivate you on you know make interest on hey, this is linear regression, this is logistic regression. This is naive base, this can be applied here, this is decision tree, I did not talk about anything about decision tree in detail, this is decision tree how to do it, there are two important parameters. With that knowledge you know what is entropy and information gain in decision tree, you can go to any resource, now you can pick it up easily. So, now you know what is this two and uh, you can watch a new video or read a paper or read a book, you might uh, get more information and more interest, all depends on your interest. So, all my videos I always talk about you know all this ML algorithms please go to Professor Andrew Ng's video if you are interested more about that or any videos. I recommend couple of papers in the videos for you to read because that is how you know how this data all this model is applied in a real data how people have used it. And uh, for the tools if it is Pro, you know, ProM or uh, Veka or Rap, uh, Orange or RapidMinute tab, you go to YouTube, there are plenty of videos explaining how to apply each and every algorithm, you know, uh, uh, like uh, what data to apply, which buttons to click, everything is there. There is no need for us to teach everything which is already existing, we do not want to reinvent the wheel. So, the idea is motivate you, there is a tool, this can be used, go and learn it, that is the whole idea, okay. And uh, this course is trying to pull out uh, you know what data to collect, what are the learning resources, what are the different environments and how you can apply it. Um, this pulling these three things you know the data collection, the environment and the ML together and how to infer that is what we are trying to do in this course not to teach every ML or the, uh, the tools or you know, algorithms. So, where do you go next? We will talk about that next. Thank you.